We're glad that you have come from many places, and we're looking forward to having a great time here tonight as we seek truth. Minister Jeffrey Muhammad said that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad offered $100,000 during his lifetime to anyone who would prove him wrong. I should have been given that $100,000 in 1977 because I proved his son, W.D. Muhammad, wrong. And some of you here tonight were there in that debate. Tonight, I'm not here just to prove someone to be wrong, but I'm here to prove that Jesus is right and that he does not need a Savior or another Jesus to help him be right. He's right all by himself. And whatever he says, is authority. So as we get into this discussion tonight, a lot of things will come to the surface. And remember that we are not enemies. We are looking for truth. I'm thankful that we're living in a country in which we can have freedom of worship and even the freedom to disagree. There are many countries in the world where you cannot stand up as I'm standing up here tonight and speak out against Islam. There are many countries in the world that you don't have that type of freedom, not only Islam, but other world religions. Many times the states uh, control those people so closely that uh, differences of opinion regarding religion cannot be discussed, but thank God we're living in America tonight and we have the freedom to preach the word of God as it is found in the Bible. I'm thankful for this. I'm going to read now my statement, position statement. The Holy Bible teaches that God, in the person of Jesus Christ, manifested himself in the flesh on earth for the redemption of all men through a literal death, burial, and resurrection from the dead. In defining this position statement, the very first words are very important. The Holy Bible teaches. Saying that the Holy Bible teaches means that I do not have to depend on a certain translation of one verse in order to prove my position. It means that there are numerous passages in the Bible that substantiate the things that I have expressed in the position statement. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20, Peter said, and this is giving us a clue as to how we should interpret the Bible. Peter said, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in the olden days by the will of men, but holy men of God speak as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And then in 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 13, Paul says, things that we speak not as man's wisdoms, uh, wisdom rather teaches, but as the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. So remember, in our discussion tonight, the Bible must interpret the Bible. The Bible is not to be interpreted by man without the assistance of God. Man can always give his own interpretation apart from God. And so the authority tonight in this assembly is not Elijah Muhammad. It's not Wallace Farad Muhammad. It is not even Jack Evans. 
The authority in this meeting tonight is Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we must listen to him, and that's the only way. I notice some of them pointing up to God. That's the only way you can hear God. Amen. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners, spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. That's the only way you can hear him. You have to listen to Jesus. So Jesus is authority in this meeting tonight. And I realize that he has given us the scripture, 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture given by the inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine and reproof and correction and instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. So we have the sufficiency of the Bible tonight. And what we want to recognize as we go into this discussion that if you can't find it in God's book, the Bible, regarding salvation, then you can't be saved by it. Amen. Another thing I need to clear up, as I always have to do in dealing with the Muslims, and that is we as Christians do not believe in three gods. Amen. We believe in one God. Amen. One God. And you know, God himself did not have to wait until the seventh century when the so-called prophet Muhammad came along to have me and to learn that there is but one God. Jesus said hundreds of years before Muhammad was born, Mark 12 and verse 29, the first of all the commandments, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. So we believe in one God and don't even start thinking that we believe in three gods. But we believe that this one God manifested himself in three ways. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Someone says he can't do that. Well, who are you to limit God? If God decides to express himself in three ways, God is God. Someone, someone wants to know how are they one? They are co-eternal, they are co-equal, they are co-substantial. Co-substantial means that they are of the same substance. They are spirit. In essence, they are spirit, like water, snow, and ice. Three forms of the same substance. Father. Son and Holy Spirit. Someone says, when I preach up, when you start adding them up, you'll get three, one plus one plus one. I don't do it like that. It's one times one times one. And that equals one. One to the third power. So we need to clear that up before uh, Mr. Mohammed, and I don't know if he even thinks we believe that way, but I know other Muslims I have talked with have felt that we believed in three gods and we do not believe in three gods. But we do believe that God in the person of Jesus Christ was manifested. That manifestation was in the flesh. And the Bible says why he had to be manifested in the flesh. Hebrews 10, yes, verses 4 and 5, yes, for it was not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. Wherefore, when he, Jesus, cometh into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body 